Elexacaftor was developed as a treatment for cystic fibrosis by Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this molecule is used in combination with other drugs and this particular molecule facilitates the trafficking of the misfolded protein to the cell membrane. And in terms of the synthesis we can really disconnect it into four main fragments like this. And I'm going to talk about two that I found particularly interesting. So there's a pyrrolidine fragment with a chiral methyl group and also this trifluoromethyl substituted pyrazole ring. Fortunately, David Hughes from Sidara Therapeutics has written an excellent article on this in opr and so I haven't had to wade through the patent literature, and I'm working from his paper that I'll link in the citations below. So talking about the pyrazole first, when you're thinking about the synthesis of heterocycles such as these, it's beneficial to keep track of the oxidation levels, so we can see we've got the acid oxidation level there, and an aldehyde oxidation level there, because that position bears a proton, and so the starting molecule is this uh, enol ether of an aldehyde at this position conjugated into a methyl ester. And when this was treated with hydrazine, that will presumably do a, a Michael addition first, um, followed by cyclization around onto the ester. And these are just two tautomeric forms to draw the product. Uh, scientists at Vertex, on the basis of previous work, had reason to expect the Bock group by treatment with Bock anhydride to go on this nitrogen here, and that fortunately that turned out to be the case. And the Bach protection was required for the next step, which is a Mitsunobu reaction. Uh, I could do a whole video on the Mitsunobu, so if you haven't come across it, just be happy that it's a way to convert a hydroxyl into a leaving group. It's a very neat way to do that in situ. Um, so the Mitsunobu was used to form this ether linkage, and then the Bach group was removed by treatment with hydrochloric acid to reveal the NH. We also described a different route to the pyrazole with this starting material, diethyl ethoxymethylene malonate. And whilst this is commercial, you could easily imagine making it from the condensation of diethyl malonate with triethyl orthoformate. And in much the same way as the last reaction when it's treated with hydrazine, Michael addition will be the first step. And the intermediate will look something like this, and then the remaining nitrogen can cyclize around onto the ester to form the ring. Treatment with Bach anhydride again protects one of the nitrogens for a Mitsunobu reaction with the alcohol fragment. And then the ethyl ester was hydrolyzed using potassium tertiary butoxide and 2-methyl THF to reveal the carboxylate. And this looks a bit less efficient than the previous route because we have this extra carbon that we need to get rid of with a decarboxylation reaction by heating it with a base in DMF. Uh, the reason for the introduction of this extra carboxylate was that it allows aqueous extraction. One of the challenges with the previous routes was it was difficult to get the desired product away from the Mitsunobu side products, whereas with a carboxylate group, this could be extracted into the aqueous layer away from the junk uh, and then obtained in pure form and then decarboxylated to afford the product in much better purity. I think it's also worth considering how they made the trifluoromethylated alcohol. And from a quick look at the literature, a very classical way to do this would be to treat a dimethylated malonate half ester, such as this, with sulfur tetrafluoride. And that would selectively deoxyfluorinate the unprotected carboxylate to afford the trifluoromethyl group. And SF4 is a horrendously reactive gaseous reagent. It releases SO2 and hydrofluoric acid on exposure to moisture. And it's really only used by really tough guys. You wouldn't want to use it unless you absolutely had to. Uh, fortunately, Vertex also published a different way to make it, and this was a particularly interesting reaction, starting from the silyl ketene acetal. They used trispipyruthenium dichloride and iodotrifluoromethane in the presence of pyrrolidine and LED light irradiation, and this is an example of photoredox chemistry, which is a pretty modern approach. And so this afforded a trifluoromethylated ester, and then some lithium aluminium hydride-like reducing agent was used to reduce it to the alcohol. These photoredox cascades can get pretty complex, but this is my interpretation of what I think is going on. So when irradiated with visible light, ruthenium-2 is excited to this excited state we call ruthenium-2 star. And this is a charge-separated state, which paradoxically is simultaneously both a strong oxidant and a strong reductant. We have pyrrolidine in the reaction mixture, and ruthenium-2 star can do a single electron oxidation to generate a pyrrolidine radical cation and become reduced to ruthenium-1. Ruthenium-1 is now a strong reductant, it wants to get rid of that electron, and it can donate it into the carbon iodine bond of trifluoromethyl iodide, and it is itself reoxidized to ruthenium-2, which can go back to the beginning of the catalytic cycle and start again. Meanwhile, we've generated an iodide anion and a trifluoromethyl radical, 
And that's a highly reactive species that can react with a silyl ketene acetal like this. It will give us a, a radical intermediate here. Uh, but of course we've still got our pyrrolidine radical cation floating around. That's a strong oxidant, and so that can get its electron back from our intermediate here. And whilst you could draw it as a cation like this, it's, it's much more correct to push the electrons down and draw it as an oxonium type species. And then finally some molecule of solvent, or perhaps the pyrrolidine, will come along and pick off the TBS group and generate this ethyl ester product. So the pyrrolidine, as well as serving as an electron shuttle, I think it's probably also there to neutralize the one mole of hydroiodic acid that will be generated by this reaction. And in reality, it's probably not this simple. For example, they obtained a mixture of the ethyl ester and the silyl protected carboxylate because the, the ethyl group can be picked off as well. But this gives you a, a general sense of what's going on. Um, like I mentioned, photoredox chemistry is pretty new. It's only really been around since 2007, and it's good to see that it's gaining traction in a process chemistry scenario. So, on to the pyrrolidine fragment, which, remember, has this chiral methyl group here. The first approach reported used an enzyme as the source of chirality, and so a Michael acceptor was reacted with 2-nitropropane, with DBU as the base. Uh, that afforded an intermediate adduct like this. And then they did an enzyme screen and they found a lipase which was effective at only touching one of the enantiomers, so they were able to extract out this unwanted enantiomer by hydrolyzing it to the carboxylic acid and retain the desired enantiomer as the methyl ester. And then once this building block had been obtained in enantiopure form, it was treated with rainy nickel and hydrogen to affect reduction of the nitro group, and then in situ that cyclizes onto the methyl ester to afford a lactam product that was reduced with lithium aluminium hydride. An alternative approach to introduce the chirality involved the enantioselective reduction of this exomethylene group with a metal catalyst with chiral ligands and hydrogen gas as the reductant. But I think the really interesting chemistry here is how they get to this lactam intermediate. They made it from a tetrasubstituted piperidone, and this is quite an interesting reaction. So if you're sitting around with nothing to do, I recommend pausing the video and seeing if you can work out the mechanism for yourself. So the combination of sodium hydroxide and chloroform generates these trichloromethyl anions in solution, and they can add into the carbonyl to generate an oxyanion intermediate, which snaps shut with the ejection of a chloride anion to form this geminal dichloroepoxide. Uh, the reaction doesn't stop here because this nitrogen lone pair is quite nicely set up to do a fragmentation of the ring, so it pushes its electrons in. And we get a slightly unusual fragmentation where the epoxide, one of the epoxide bonds, breaks, uh, ejects another chloride anion and generates an acid chloride intermediate. And so to draw that in a less tortured form, that looks like this molecule here. And then the reaction can take two pathways, and it really, the question is, what is the role of the hydroxide base in the remainder of the reaction. Both of the pathways involve the nitrogen attacking into the acid chloride to cyclize and form the lactam. If the hydroxide does a nucleophilic attack at this position, then we'll get to this hemiaminal, and this is unstable under the reaction conditions, and acetone will fall off the molecule and take us straight to the desired product. However, if the hydroxide base does a deprotonation, takes off a proton at this position, uh, we'll get the enamine product here, and that's a little bit more robust, and so that's the reason for the second step with hydrochloric acid, that hydrolyzes this enamine, and again, takes us to the desired product. And I already mentioned the final steps of this synthesis, the chiral reduction was used to reduce the exomethylene group, and then a stronger reducing agent would have been used to reduce the lactam down to a pyrrolidine. And so that's the synthesis routes for the two building blocks I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this pyrazole isn't particularly interesting, but from, a, again, a brief look at the literature, I think that's almost certainly made by reaction of the sulfonyl chloride with ammonia to form the sulfamide, and the sulfonyl chloride can be obtained from the reaction of the unsubstituted pyrazole with chlorosulfuric acid. And so all that remains is to stick all these pieces together. So the first fragment to be introduced was the trifluromethyl substituted pyrazole, that was an SNAR with potassium carbonate and DABCO, and that adds in presumably at the less hindered of the two chloro positions. The tert-butyl ester here on the pyridine was removed with treatment with hydrochloric acid, and then the revealed carboxylate was activated by treatment with carbonyl diamidazole and DBU, and that enabled a coupling with the sulfonamide to install this fragment of the molecule. And then the final step is a second SNAR reaction at the one remaining chloride 
position to install the pyrrolidine fragment, this time using potassium carbonate as the base. And this completes the synthesis of Alexa-Kaftor. And what's nice about this route is it's very convergent, so a lot of the tricky chemistry was gotten out of the way by making all of these building blocks separately and then plugging them together with quite robust SNAR chemistry at a late stage to afford the final product.